nation. Hebrew Kingdom Building. All right, shalom, shalom, everybody. Uh, we give all praises to the Most High. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, right now it's important for you to go to subscribe to um, Black Hebrew Awakening. Black Hebrew Awakening, uh, that's where we're going to be doing our lives uh, for our own. Uh, we can still upload videos, so you will still see the uploads. But if, uh, but if you want to catch the, the Wednesday night and the Saturdays and the Sunday morning prayer, um, that's where we're going to be going live on Black Hebrew Awakening. Um, now, uh, YouTube channel been sh uh, live has been shut down for about three months uh, for right now. So using that channel and the uh, extra backup channel, go subscribe to the Beginners channel. The Beginners channel is uh, Rebirth Bridge and they got a lot of, a lot of Beginners videos um, where you can uh, send your family members and different ones so they can understand from a better perspective. Uh, or if you got new people in the truth and you want to send them there, we got some of our major documentaries on there, on that channel, and like 10 minute little segments talking about different subjects, introducing people to the faith from our perspective. Um, so please go and subscribe to Rebirth Bridge for that, and also subscribe to Biblical Hebrew Awakening for the live feed, so you'll be able to catch that. And also the Biblical Hebrew Awakening, it has a 24 hour, that's our 24 hour channel and it has nothing but 24 hour documentaries and 24 hour teachings that go on for 24 hours consistently through the day. You can stop in on your lunch break or whatever break you on and be able to check out those things. So we want to announce those things uh, real quick um, so you can know uh, what's going on and how we moving. Um, okay. Let's get into, this is part two. Now, you really have to go back and look at the uh, first series. It's uh, uh, Yahushua, the rights into the covenant. Go look at that video because I can't rehash everything that I already talked about, but there's some profound information because this is what we have to know before and walk in, before we have the mantles drop on us, before we begin to uh, walk into these mantles, before we begin to be ministers of his judgment, before we begin to operate even understanding the Melchizedek order, uh, this is how you function in that, in the, um, the Melchizedek order, um, how you are able to grasp these things by taking these initiations to a right of return to this covenant. Now, understand, no, we have to get the uh, Christian mentality and mindset out of our mind because you cannot return to a covenant by a prayer. I'm going to say that again. You cannot return to a covenant by a sinner's prayer, by saying vain words as if those things are going to completely um, return you back to a covenant that was broken. And this is why I always say you have to go back and get your ancient mind back. Where you're going into the scriptures and you're understanding from an ancient perspective, right? From an ancient perspective, how things was done, um, their thought pattern on covenants, or why did the Most High use covenant, what the people of that day understood by covenants when they was making a covenant, a blood covenant, and then what did it take if a covenant was broken and a people wanted to return? Did a covenant go through your bloodline? And uh, for future generations, were there an opportunity for a nation of people or whoever came into covenant with their deity or with their person, was the covenant able to be repaired if it was broken? And if so, how is it able to be repaired? So we might get that same strength of the covenant, understanding of the covenant, power of the covenant. And I believe that's some of the things that we're missing because we tried it. We have returned with our heart, mind, and soul, but it's different things that we had to understand for the power of the covenant to be enacted in our life. And I believe when you understand this, acceleration in your life, you're going to, acceleration going to hit your life because you're going to come back into what the peace or the bond of the covenant where you have taken the right of passage, uh, uh, the right steps in order to return to Yahuwah. Because you just can't return to him by praying. It's Yahushua set out everything that Yahushua did. Uh, the world uh, know him as uh, Jesus, but we know him as Yahushua. So I'm saying Yeshua. The best uh, he gave us, he was the mediator of the covenant. So all of his life of being here and his short ministry was showing us the steps back unto the covenant. The steps back into uh uh, right standing with the most high, how to get his hostility away from you and him to be back on your side. Isn't it 
powerful when you think about what our ancestors was able to do, right? When you think about the power they possess and the mindset that they had, it's something that we're lacking today, right? Um, for them to be able to call down fire from heaven and know that they can do that and know that they were, they can uh, stop the sun. Uh, being able to have that tip mentality, knowing that when a lion, like David guarding the sheep, when a lion come, that he ran after a lion because he know that the most high was in his hands. When he when he swung on that beast, that he knew that it was the most high strength hitting that beast. Samson be able to fight a thousand Philistines, that he would have jawbone of a donkey, jawbone of an ass when he would hit the Philistines. He knew it was the most high hitting through him because they knew the most high was in them and through them that Moshe was able to go to the, one of the biggest nations in the world at that time and shut that nation down with a staff. Right. The mentality that they had, that they was able, Joshua was able to send the people to march around Jericho and order and blow trumpets and the walls of that country go down and they was able to take the city. All of these type of things. Right. They was able to function in because they understood they had came into the bond of the covenant where the Most High said, I will be your Elohim and you will be my people. I will fight your battles. I will give you my riches. I will be uh, on the shade upon your right hand. Uh, I will let us sleep or slumber. I will be watchful over you. I will send Malachim, what to guard you and keep you from dashing your foot upon the stone. The, uh, a thousand may fall at your uh, right hand and, uh, and 10,000 at your left hand, but it shall not come near you because what you're in covenant with me. Now that we that we broke that covenant, we lost it. Then the strength of that covenant left because our God had to sell us according to Deuteronomy 32, that our rock had sold us because what we broke the covenant. So now we are finding out the pattern and how to come back because we want those same benefits. We want that same authority. We want that same power that our ancestors had. And we want that very thing that this nation is afraid of us. It's no way that we are powerless people. We have no military might. We have no, uh, 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 we don't have things on our own. We have nothing to make you afraid of us. We don't have a history of just in America, not history in America, of just slaughtering people and taking control of people. But they so afraid of us because what they know what's in our history. They know when we wake back up and get into right standing with our Elohim, what it means for their kingdom. And they're afraid of that. So this is going to help us get right back into that into that right state with the Most High. And we're going to be able to flourish in Him when we go back in the ancient paths. Go seek the ancient paths and begin to walk these paths out. Internalize these paths. Return unto Him. <clears throat> As He said in Deuteronomy 30, He said, When the blessing and the curse have come upon you, and you call them to mind among the nations where I have driven you, but then you return unto me with all your heart, mind, and soul. He said, what? Well, I will remember the covenant. And in 1 Kings 8, he said, I will even maintain your cause. So he's going to remember the covenant that he made with our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how it will flow down to us. So in this message, you're going to be able to understand what it will it take in order to return from a broken covenant through Yahusha in order for us to get back in right standing and get the power of the covenant. And I believe when you understand these things and go through these things, that's why it's a good, important to go back to that first message. Yahusha the rights back into covenant. Listen to that and then embody that and then listen to this and go through these things again and watch how acceleration hits your life. Because we're going to need that type of protection before, because of what we have to face, right? Now let's 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 move. Let me slide through all of these things. All right, let me slide through this. We understand that what we talked about before, before the first order of priesthood is sacrifice because of love. So Romans twelve and one, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of 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 Elohim, that you would present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So it's our reasonable service to sacrifice our lives for our brother and live a holy and acceptable life unto the most high. If you uh, listen to the first message, you'll know what I, what I mean when I say a life for a life. Now let's keep going because I got to go through all of this. I, wanna, I don't want to rehash this stuff, so just... Bear with me real quick. 
so I can get to this stuff. All this stuff is extremely important to watch this series and go over this stuff so you can be prepared to walk in what the most I have for us. All right, let's move through these things. Almost there. Okay, here. Now, we first got to understand what happens in, in ancient Eastern cultures when a covenant was broken. We have to understand that then how a covenant is made, but what would happen when a covenant is broken? How can you renew it, right? And uh, I will send you, if somebody need the, um, where I'm pulling this information from, as far as all you got to do is uh, begin to study ancient Near East covenants and how they are made and you, this information will pop up. Uh, but if you want the things directly, let me know and I can send things to you. What happened when ancient Near East cultures went into a covenant and it was broken? Covenants after its initial ratification, that means its initial uh, um, uh, initiation, the starting of a covenant, might also regularly be rehearsed or renewed with much of the attendant verbiage and ceremony of the original ratification. So this is why you will see a lot of time that uh, Moshe and different other leaders, they would rehearse the law, they would read the book of the law, they would read the covenant and rehearse the covenant. Even the kings had to do that when they rehearse and would read the covenant. Um, to the nation or to the body of people so it can continuously stay in their mind and in their children's mind. Now, let's see what happens. A renewal might occur when the terms of the covenant have been broken and the violated parties found need for restoration or renewal might occur on a regular schedule. Later generations who by birth became party to the covenant as originally enacted by their progenitors also might seek a renewal. When renewed, some of the terms might be adapted by mutual agreement because of the containing parties in order to adjust the stipulations and change in the circumstances. And so this is why you can look within our covenant and see some things that have been changed, right? You see that um, the priesthood, our high priest, now it's Yehushin, we'll get to that, and our sacrifice is Yehushin. So this is why we're not necessarily just uh, bringing all type of animals in um, for remission of our sins. Things have been adapted in stipulations in order to get the covenant renewed. Let's keep going. Now I read this. That's why I got this in red. But nevertheless, the covenant came into force in its entirely and precisely at the temple nexus with its initial legal ratification. Watch this. Renewals were only reinstatements and reaffirmations of an original covenant already in force. They were not new covenants in themselves. I'm going to read that again. Renewals were only reinstatements and reaffirmation of original covenants already in force. They were not new covenants in themselves. So this is why we don't call it a new covenant. This is why from a Hebraic understanding, when you understand Eastern thought and how Eastern covenants was formed, this is why I tell you, always go back and study your covenant so you can understand what you're doing. You can understand what you're getting into. You'll understand the need of restoration, the need of renewal as a body of people, right? So it says, and this is how we got to get out of the Greek mindset and thinking everything is new because everybody in the Eastern world knew what it took to repair a covenant. They weren't starting a new one. They were just restoring the one that was lost. It'll, it'll be, uh, to, to make it plain, it'll be the same as if my ancestors, right, uh, built the house and I inherited that house. The house was a beautiful house when they first built it. Say they built it in uh, the early 1900s. It was a beautiful house, right? But I inherited the house and I didn't find out that this year that was my house. Now, I go in the frame of the house is still there. The body of the house is still there. It's a nice house. But I would have to go in that house, clean that house up, and remodel that house from the inside out. Now, have I made a new house? No, I haven't made a new house. I just, what, restored it and renewed it, made it uh, livable and restored the, the original house to make it livable now. 
to make it a place where we can dwell in now. It has the same purpose as the original house, which was was shelter and a place to stay, but I made it more comfortable and made the ability of the house to be repaired and restored for it to complete its original purpose. Hope that made sense. Let's keep going. So, dear, can we see this? Am I just pulling this out of the air, or can we see this in the scriptures? Jeremiah 31 and 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahuwah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Now, understand that those are English words, but you have to go into Hebrew and see what the word new mean. And when you look at the lexicon, Strong's H2318, uh, Hadash. When you look up the root word, the root word, it means to be new, to renew, or to repair. To renew, to make a new, to repair, to renew oneself. So this is the same thought from an Eastern perspective. Now, I know when you go to Hebrews 8 and 8 and you look it up in the Greek, it says new. But you got to remember that in Hebrews, he was echoing something that he heard from Jeremiah, which was written in Hebrew that came from Hebrew thought that came from East and ancient Near East culture that they would have knew. That's why the root word is renew or repair to renew oneself. So I hope that's clear. Right. So we are not making a new covenant, but we are repairing one back to its full restoration. All right, let's keep moving. Now, John 14 and 6. Watch this. Yahushua said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming unto me and come to the Father, but by through me. Now, a lot of people might look at that, like you have your non messianics A lot of them might look at that and think of that as a blasphemous state, uh, a statement. That is a middleman between the Father and the Father and his people. But it has always been like that. It has always been like that. The high priest during the Day of Atonement was the middleman. You couldn't go to the holies of holies. Uh, 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 the Israelites can just walk up in the holies of holies. You can just run up in there like that. You had to be called a priest and then a high priest to enter the holy of holies. You had to be from the Levitical uh, uh, priesthood and then a high priest uh, from the lineage of Aaron to be able to consider to atone for the sins of the nation and of the people. So this is why. Because if you didn't come with a right sacrifice, your sacrifice was not going to be accepted by the Most High. That high priest had to approve, the, the, and the Levites had to approve the sacrifices of the people in order to make it your sacrifice acceptable unto the Most High. So it's always a middleman that was between your alignment and restoration of the Most High when you messed up. So Yahushua was saying the same thing that I am the way, the truth, and the light. This is the way that you're going to get back to the Father. It's going to come through this high priest now. But now this high priest is both sacrifice and high priest that have created the way for you, have the created the truth for you, and have created the eternal life that you'll be able to walk in through me. But the concept is there. But he is the ultimate high priest. He is your only direction to the Father. It's no way that you can return to the Father because you made a blood covenant. And a blood covenant, you have blood on your hands and it was broken. So it's no other way. You can't pray your way back to him. You can't live righteously and get back to him without having a sacrifice. That all things uh, are, are purged through what? Through blood. Without blood, there's no remission of sins. So you can pray, you can holler, you can do all those type of things all you want, but you can't get back into fellowship with the Father by overstepping his system that he already set up from the beginning. So it's no way that you can return to the Father. I don't care how much Hebrew you're able to read, how much Hebrew you know, you cannot return to Abba Yahuwah without a blood sacrifice or something that atoned for your sins. That he set up to atone. Even in our scattering, he had already set up a high priest and a sacrifice for 
our sins that even when we are scattered, when there's no temple, no individual high priest or Levitical priesthood that we can see and designate that our sins would be covered through what he set up through Yahushua that laid down his life for the atonement of the people. And taking the hostility away from us from breaking the covenant where the Most High can have peace with us. Now we can boldly come before the throne of grace and ask for our petitions. Because we know what? Our high priest is sitting on the right hand of the Father being our advocate with interceding for us. So let's, let's, let's make that plain. Leviticus 16. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. That is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of bullocks and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Who is making the atonement? The high priest. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. Who is doing this? The high priest. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make atonement in the holy place until he come out and hath made the atonement. What is that saying? That no other man can come was able to come through the come to the Father, but through the high priest. This was a concept that was already there. Verse 17, and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth to make the atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made the atonement. Verse 16, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. So one man was the mediator between the most high. And you had a whole tribe of Levites that was a mediator between the most high and the children of Israel. So now Yahushua is that ultimate high priest that is in the heavenly sitting at the right hand of the father right now as an advocate and nobody can come through the father but through that high priest let's keep going let's prove this hebrews 10 the ultimate sacrifice for the nation for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which i have offered year by year continuously make the covers the uh, perfect for then would they have not ceased to be offered because of the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there was a remembrance again of the sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offering would as I not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Now is a body that's going to be prepared for me. Verse 6, And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said, Lo, I come in a volume of the book, because it's written to me to do thy will, o Elohim, above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and sin that thou wouldest not, neither hast thou pleasure therein which offered by the law. Then said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He take away the first that he may establish the second, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of who? Yahushua HaMashiach once and for all. So we see that a body that he prepared for him, that through Yahushua, we have been sanctified for, for one and for all. So if you don't walk in him and accept him as your high priest, you have no way to the Father. You have no passage to the Father. You have no direct, you, you can't pray your way, walk your way in. It has to be through a sacrifice that he set up. All right, let's keep going. First Peter 1, the Lamb of the nation. 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, For as much as we know that we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, uh, you can't buy your way back from your vain lifestyles received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Yahushua. So what is that saying? That you can't, with, you, with, with money, silver and gold, ain't going to redeem you, or vain lifestyles received by the tradition of your father. That's going right back to, you can't, do traditions and just do law and come back to the Father. 
You can't. You have to accept the sacrifice. No, the sacrifice ain't no idol because it's the same concept that was in the uh, uh, in the original covenant. So he's not an idol. You got so many scriptures that talks about the father and him having a son, but his son being the only way, his son being the high priest. How can that be an idol when it was something that was already set up? Was the original high priest, was Aaron an idol? Was uh, Moshe an idol? Were the original ones, were they an idol? No. This is what he set up from the beginning for us to be able to understand the concept for it was a shadow of things to come when the real things through, through the predestination appointed time was to take force. Then we would get the revelation and understand that we already been walking in this until the real thing happened. All right, let's keep going. But verse 19, but with the precious blood of Yahushua as the lamb without blemish or without spot, same thing that a lamb have be without blemish or spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in his last times for you. So this was foreordained from the foundation of the world, but it was made manifest in this last time for you. Why would it be made manifest for you? Because he knew that we would be a people that would be scattered to the four corners of the world. So he knew that he had to make, have had to prepare a body that a lamb had to be slain before we were scattered. So even in our scatter, scattering, when we be in our graveyards, when we be in all these lands that, uh, perpetuate our death that our sins would still be covered. And it was the same way that happened in the first exodus. Before the first exodus happened, they the lamb had to be slain so the death angel could pass by them and they would be kept until the time that for them to go into the wilderness and then to enter the promised land. The same thing happened on a national level what, that a lamb, a sacrifice was already slain to cover the people before the scattering and before the second exodus. And then when we get coming to the bond of the covenant, while we're in the wilderness, then I will write a passage into the land. So the same pattern that was left beforehand is the same pattern that he gave us. Um, even this, this is why he said the lame lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. That lamb wasn't the same lamb that was in the Exodus, when the first Exodus, an actual lamb had to be slain. But it was another lamb because he knew the nation of the body of Israel was going to be scattered. So he had already a plan of salvation before the problem even came. That's why he said this was for you. Who verily was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, whom by him do believe in Elohim, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in Elohim. Let's keep going. So we've seen that he's the sacrifice, right? Now let's look at him being a high priest. Hebrews 10 and verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering all times the same sacrifice, which can never be to take away sins, right? We was talking about the priest before. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of Yahuwah. From his force, expecting to his enemies be made his footstool. But that's a Hebrew idiom right there, but that'll take me off the lesson. 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them, them that are sanctified. So by his offering, he hath perfected us that in him that are sanctified, that are set apart, that are made holy, that are what? Are on the inside of the tent wall. We've been perfected in him even though we fall, even though we have some things that mess us up, even though we mess up sometimes, when we accept his sacrifice, right, and we walk in him and we take on him as a robe, like we talked about before, when we take on his identity and his character and his authority and walk in his reputation and the things that he has given us, then we are perfected and sanctified until the day of our redemption. We're going, are we going to make mistakes? Yeah. Are we going to fall? Yeah. Are we going to mess up? Yeah. But our position it's been declared righteous because we are in him. So this is why 
the scripture talks about how every tear, he's going to wipe away every tear. Because a lot of these things he knew we wouldn't be acting in or performing if we was in right covenant with him. But we got cast out. We got cast out to the dogs and to the whole mongers and to uh, 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 the tormentors and, uh, the, the, and been raised in a, a society of wickedness that we see wickedness all around us, that he know we wouldn't make those same decisions if we weren't in our right, if we was in our right covenant. That's why he sanctified us and set us apart in him once and for all when he, when, when, when he laid down his life and when we accepted him to walk in him. Now we have been declared righteous and have been sanctified and we walk out the perfection now until the day of redemption. So this is why our tears is going to be wiped away. Because some of the things that we're struggling with, he has sanctified us and has declared us righteous that you already been perfected, but perfection has to work through you. And it's going to work there. That, that's why you shouldn't just be, you know, downcasted. You shouldn't be uh, condemning yourself and all those things because you have been declared righteous and declared sanctified when you accept in him and obey him because the only way of acceptance is through obedience and obey him, then he will perfect the things that concern you, but your position in him have been declared righteous before you was born. All right, let's keep going. For by one offering he perfected forever them that are sanctified, wherefore the holy, the royal Hakadesh also a witness to us. For after that he hath said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith Yahuwah. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will in, in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Look at that, y'all. Wherefore, the Ruach HaKadosh also is a witness to us. For after that he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith Yahuwah. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds what I write them. And their sins and iniquities I will what? Remember no more. And now there, now where remission of these, now where remission of these is there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holies of holy by the blood of Yahushua, now we can enter into that place of right fellowship and communion with the Most High through the Ruach HaKadosh, through what? The life what Yahushua has shed for us. Verse 20, by a new and living way which we have consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having an high priest over the house of Elohim. Now we have a high priest. This is why now we take our petitions to the high priest for him to judge them righteously to see what prayers and what petitions are going to be performed through the Most High. Now, just as uh, we would present our offerings to the priest and to the high priest, the same as Yahushua, that he would take our petitions. And he said, if you ask anything in my name, under my authority, under my household, because I'm the high priest, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Right? If you will, if you abide in him and he abides in you. Right? So now I can present my case or we as priests can present the children of Israel or other people case to the most high that he may judge us to see if Yahushua is uh, uh, to see if 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 Yahuwah is going to grant us our requests through what Yahushua presents them to him, as we present, because what divine order Yahuwah over Yahushua, Yahushua over the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel over the nations. All right, let's keep going. Verse 20, by a new and living way we have consecrated for us through the veil that is, that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of Elohim. Let us now do what? Draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful to that what is promised. Now when we understand our covenant, when we understand coming back to him, when he understand the, the, the sacrifice it's going to take, a life for a life coming back to him, now let us draw to the Most High with full assurance. Let's see what it says. It says, 
uh, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed uh, with pure water. Now we know, because now I'm coming to him as a son. I'm coming to him as a son now and coming to him as a daughter, not as a slave, not as a servant. It'll be the same thing if you was to come with me to my parents' house. And I walk into my parents' house and you with me. I can go straight in my parents' refrigerator and start getting something to eat. I can go straight in their cabinet and pull things out of it and take it with me. I can go straight on their stove and get the cooking. Because what? I'm a son of the house. I can come to my parents as a son knowing that my petitions will be granted. Now, as my friend, you can't come in my parents' house doing that. Because why? You are not in debt covenant with them be, to be able to do that. You're just a friend of me. All right? So you can come in there doing that. But I can, I can approach my parents' house and approach my parents' will as a son. And this is how we have to go to prayer, not as like we talk in Christianity, as sinner saved by grace. No, but a son that has been restored in the covenant now. Now I know the confidence and the expectation of my petitions, uh, uh, petitions uh, uh, through faith will be granted. I don't go to him like if it's going to happen. No, I'm a son now that's been restored. And I know that everything I'm doing is within the covenant. So he said, even that he has given us what the power to get wealth to be able to establish his covenant. Everything I'm doing now, now I'm doing not for selfish gain. Because what? In order to be in covenant with somebody, you have to have self-denial. And that's why Yahushua should say, well, if any man will come after me, he has to do what? Deny himself. You can't, not, you can't be an independent and be in covenant with Yahushua. Because you will die. The very thought of covenant is uh, dependency upon the person that you get in covenant with. No more independent. That's why it talks about in marriage. And the marriage covenant is a blood covenant where the two will become what? One flesh. Individuality has to lead. This is why you eat the bread and this is why you drink the wine. In order to symbolize being one body and being one life. Let's keep going. All right, I got the roll. All right, so the oath of a covenant and returning. Now, this is important. Please understand this. The important of an oath. That which immediately and legally placed a covenant into forth was the oath. I'm going to read that again. That which immediately and legally placed a covenant in forth was the oath. Although various sim symbolic covenants or conventions might attend an ancient Near East ratification ceremonies, the one component essential to all covenants was the swearing of the oath. Only by this means was the covenant formally actuated and acted or ratified. That means or cut. A covenant ceremony might include a meal. It could incorporate some of the sacrifices. A token might be assigned. A libation of some other physical act performed. Nevertheless, there was no legal contract. No implementation of terms or benefits and parts in a whole. No obligatory force was factual or realization until the moment when the party, un, un, you know, unilaterally or parties bilaterally officially swore to the terms of the covenant. So this is what makes a covenant enacted and cut and ratified and started when you say the oath that yes, I will or yes, I desire or I will walk into these terms of this covenant. I will fulfill my role. Once you say that, the heavens and the earth witness against you. The people that are there is a witness against you. And the Elohim that you are making a covenant under is a witness. And now the oath coming to come into uh, effect. And you can go to the go to Exodus 24 and start at verse 3 and read all the way down to 8 to 10. And you will see where Israel said, all these things that the Most High said, says we will do. Then he sprinkled the blood upon the, uh, the people, upon the pillar, and they became into covenant with the Most High. So even in a marriage covenant, it ain't the sex that makes you marry. It's the oath that makes you marry. When you do an oath to each other and you do the vows to each other and the ketubah and it's agreed to and both parties speak with witnesses 
of the Most High and witnesses around it. Then the oath is cut and then the sex binds you together and that what makes you one flesh. But the oath is what seals the marriage. All right. Now, now we know, well, let's, let's, let me look at this. We know that we have already did an oath. That in our ancestry, our fathers, according to Exodus uh, 24 and 3, our father, let me see if I can read that for y'all real quick. So you can see what I'm talking about. Let's see, let me see. Read that real quick. I'm going to go there. Um, Exodus 24. All right. Verse 3. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahuwah and all his judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all these words of Yahuwah, he had said, we will do. Verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of Yahuwah and, and rose up in the early in the morning, built an altar unto the hill and 12 pillars, according to the 12 tribe of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings and asses unto Yahuwah. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood and he sprinkled it on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that Yahuwah have said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it upon the people. And blood, he said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which Yahuwah have made with you concerning all these words. This is when the actual covenant came into effect with our people. So an oath have already been made, right? Now, how do we return to an oath that has been broken? Let's see. You have to agree to the terms. The oath has already been made, Matthew 5. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it's the footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Neither shall you swear by the head, because thou has not make one hair uh, black or white. But let your communication be yea and nay, for whatsoever is more than these commit evil. So Yahushua said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. You ain't got to make no oath no more. Just agree and do. Agree and do. Agree and do. Let your yea be yea. If you say you're going to do it, get it done. If you say you're not going to do that, don't do it. So what do we do now? Let's look. Matthew 10 and 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. What does uh, confess means? To acknowledge or by implication, to agree fully, to acknowledge openly, to profess. To profess or confess. To acknowledge openly and joyfully to one's honor, to celebrate, to give praise, to profess that one will do something, to promise or agree or engage. So our job now is to agree or profess the terms of the covenant. So the terms I already showed you that the covenant sacrifice was Yahushua and he's the high priest. So we have to agree with what was spoken about him to come back under the oath that was broken. Because he is our way, he is our truth, and he is our life. So the thing, life, so the things that was spoken about him, we have to confess and agree wholeheartedly with it. So when these things are spoken about him, we have to say, yes, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and live towards that. This is how you come and come back to an oath that has been broken. You don't make another oath. You agree to the terms of the returning of the covenant and what it says about the entity that's going to return you. This is what was given. This is the ambassador of the kingdom. And we have to agree to him to be returned back from a broken oath. Let's see what it says. Confess. We have to confess and agree that he's the only way. Yahushua said, I am the way back to the, the Father. I am the truth of the covenant. I am and I am the eternal life that no man come to the Father but by me. We have to agree with that. 
We have to profess that. We have to believe that wholeheartedly to get back to the Father. This is our commitment. This is our return to the oath. The original oath. When our answer says all, answer said, all these things we will do. And they broke it. Now to repair it, we have to believe and confess that Yahushua is the sacrifice and he is the high priest. He is the only way back to the Father. Can no man come back to the Father? We have to profess that. That's why we can't walk hand in hand with non-Messianics. We can't. We can't just do things with non-Messianics. Because they, they are still dead. Because what? They came back into a covenant. And when we broke the covenant, he said that we made what? A covenant with death and the grave. So can, how can the living be in the congregation of the dead and try to function together? They still in their grave. They hasn't been resurrected yet. So we have to agree because of the oath that has been broken. Now, Yahushua made an oath that he said, not my will, but your will be done. That he's going to be the sacrifice. And we have to agree with what the father stated about his son in order to come back unto him. This is how we complete the oath and agree and we let not yea be yea. I hope this makes sense. What else? Let me get to, okay, I'm missing a slide. I'm missing a slide. Let me go down because I'm missing a slide. Wow. Let me keep going. I might have to just say it. Um, off top. Because I'm not seeing these slides I put in here with it. Yet. That's all right. That's all right. We're going to work it out. We're going to work it out. We're going to work it out. Gonna work it out. That's all right. I don't see it. All right. Well, don't worry about it. I'm gonna have to just quote it because I had it in here. And I must have um, then saved that slide like I thought I did. So anyway, everything that is spoken about Yahushua, we got to believe. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life that no man can come to the Father but through him. He, he says that, I think it's in John that talks about that, whoever denies the Son also denies the Father and has the spirit of the Antichrist. And we have to believe that the same spirit that was in Yahushua that raised him from the dead would be the same spirit that raised us up in the last day. We have to believe that, that, that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The things that he declared about himself, we have to confess and agree with those things that he's spoken of himself. That's why it's important. I have it in here and I can't find it. Why well, it's important to go back and look at the words that he said about himself. We have to believe that he's the shepherd. We have to believe that lays down his life for a sheep. We have to believe that he's the door. And if you climb up any other, other way, we have to confess that. We have to believe that that's what it is. It's just like when you're in a marriage, uh, 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 when you're uh, doing your vows in your marriage and you're writing out, and saying that all the things that you do when you're doing your vows to each other and you look at each other and you say, I do. That means I agree. So the Most High is giving us everything that it's going to take for us to return about his son. That he's the only way. He's the door. He's the shepherd. Can't no man come to the Father without, without him. He has sanctified us through his truth. He is the one that gives us eternal life. He is the bread that came down from heaven. If any man that eat this bread and drink of the, uh, this cup would never uh, hunger or thirst again. 
The things that are said by him are not just sayings. And it's not blasphemy, but it's, it's, it's for us to return and for our oath to be repaired. This is what we have to believe by what he said. The things that were spoken about him that he said and the apostle says and Yahuwah said and spoke. All right, let's keep going. Man, I, I hate I didn't have these things in here. The terms of the covenant, you will have to look at the, the teachings that your, uh, Yahushua, uh, let, let, uh, you know, uh, through uh, from Matthew 5 all the way through. Self-denial is terms of a covenant. Luke 9 and 23 and Matthew 16 and 24 that says that uh, if any man will come after me, he has to do what? He has to first deny himself. You can't come into covenant and be in a covenant with a person and still have individuality. The whole point of the covenant is to make two people one. The whole point and essence of a covenant is to make two people one. You have to image the father. John 6 and 36, he said, I didn't come to bring my own initiative, to do my own will, to, uh, to, to bring my own words. He said, I only do the will of the father. And, and, and I only speak as he speaks. I, I only see as he sees. That's why it says that we have been made in the image of uh, we've been conformed to the image of Christ. And from a Hebrew or, or Mashiach, from a Hebrew perspective, what does image mean? It ain't saying that you just bodily look like a person. Image, being made in somebody's image is saying that you act, everything you do is like that person. You talk like that person. You walk like that person. You think like that person. Uh, you speak, you move like that person. To image somebody is to come into their reflection. What is that? You are a reflection of them. You are a reflection of the full body. So Yahushua was a reflection of the Most High. He was his image. He was the word made flesh. He was the bread. He was everything, the pattern from heaven was embodied in Yahushua. He imaged his father. That's why I, I don't speak my own words. I don't say my own initial. I don't have my own commandment. All these things I do because of what my father gave me to do. And then this is the image what we're supposed to have of Yahushua, that we are reflecting him. This is why he said, do these things in my name. It ain't just letters, but do it in my name's sake, in my character. Image me, conform into my image. Be me on the earth as the father have sent me now I'm sending you. As I was the father's body, now you are my body. You're a reflection of me. You don't have no individuality uh, uh, outside of me because I didn't have no individuality outside of my father. Image me. He said, if you continue in my word, John 8 and 38, then you are my disciple. Continue in the terms of the covenant, right? Continue in the terms of the covenant. That's John 8 and 30. And Yahushua spoke these things and many believed in him. And he said unto the Yahudim who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my image. Then you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. These are the terms in order to return. The first term is agreeing with who Yahushua was. This is why before he gave the Ruach, to the disciples, before he gave the Ruach to those that are supposed to be imaging him, he said, first he said, who the man say that I am? So he said, I want to see if y'all been following me. I want to see if y'all ready to confess me. Then he said, who do you say that I am? He told Thomas, he said, he said show us the father. He said, Thomas, have I been with you that you ain't seen the father? He said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father, because we are made what in the same image. That's not just talking about physicality, but I mirror him. I do from my ancient thought perspective the things that he's doing. I'm his reflection. So this is why they, Peter had to say, thou art the anointed one, the Mashiach. And he said what? Flesh and blood ain't revealing to you, but only who my father. That means now through your, he said, flesh and blood ain't revealed to this, this to you. But he said, my father. So your very acknowledging and confessing who I am have demonstrated to the father that now you are accepted. That's what he was saying. 
He said, if you got that revelation, that means what you have been, now you have right of passage back into this covenant. Because the revelation been given to you of who I am, you confessed it, then came into a broken oath now that has been repaired now. Now you can come back to me now. Now, evidence of you knowing who I am is the revelation that now you accept it. Now, the Father, me and the Father can manifest ourselves to you now. Because you confess me. You agree that I am that I am. You agree with the things that I've spoken and you align your life of reflection of me. Now you can return back to my covenant. Right, so passage. Let's look at some ceremonial rites of passage that turns us back into the covenant, right? The bread and wine. And we talked about a lot of this with the Melchizedek order. We understand. Let's look at it. The entire household, tribes, and families came together to share a meal or a feast and further making them one because the same food became part of the bodies of both sides. The elders first feed one another saying, this is my body, take it and eat. Meaning I will die and let you eat my flesh before I let you starve. Then the elders feed each other wine representing life, meaning everything that I am, even daughters, sons, foods, possessions, and everything. Then the rest of the family would feed each other in bread and wine and thus enter into a covenant relationship, never to leave each other or forsaken. So bread and wine, and it's talking about when two families, tribes coming into covenant with each other, or if you take a husband and wife, what, 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 what part of that ceremony is bread and wine back in the day. This is why the Israelites would, if you notice, if you just put bread and wine in, in a search, and you'll see how much they carry bread and wine everywhere with them. Because they didn't know at what moment or what time that they would be making a covenant with somebody. That would become a one with somebody. And sometimes they needed covenants in order to pass through lands. Because we was a nomadic people. Sometimes fleeing persecution. So we would have these things with us just in case we needed to make a covenant real quick. Because back then your yay was yay and your nay was nay. You was a man of your word. So the bread represented when two people eat of the same bread, that means they are partaking of the same body. So this body is going into both of their systems, making them one with this bread, making them one with each other. And then they would feed each other um, the bread in order to make a statement of that before I allow you to starve, I, you know, like it says right here, well, let me go back to what it says. I'll die and let you eat my flesh before I allow you to starve. You know, these are the things that are blood covenant because now it doesn't come about you. Your goal now is to be a living sacrifice for this other person. And to drink wine was to become one life. To eat bread was to become one body, but to drink wine was to become one life. Because what the wine represented the blood. At our ancient Near East Coast, they would actually drink blood, but that's against our laws. So the Most High allowed us to use wine to become in one. Then this is why uh, during the uh, Passover time, this is why they took the bread and took the wine. They said, do this in remembrance of me returning to my covenant. And then Paul said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of Mashiach. Because people are going to need bread and wine in order to come into covenant with Mashiach. It's an ancient right to, to be in covenant. So let's look at the spiritual body how we became one that's john 17 john 17 and 1 sanctify them through your truth that word is truth as thou hast sent me into the world even so i have sent them into the world like i just spoke of early and for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified through truth so he became sanctification or he made himself holy that we may be holy through the truth Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So this is why it's important for, as he sanctified himself, it's important for us to be sanctified so others can be set apart. Verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I am in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou hast gave me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. So we'll be one just like Father and Yahushua are one. 
Verse 23, I am in them and thou art in me and they, that they may be made perfect in oneness and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. This showing you the oneness that eating of the bread and drinking of the cup. This is how we become one with Yahushua. This is how John 17 begins to be activated in our lives. That first we have to agree verbally speaking in the atmosphere that we believe these things about Yahushua, of who he is. That we know who he is, the revelation of who he is. And then the next thing, you know, it ain't in no particular order, is bread and wine, right? He said, do this in remembrance of me. Here, take this is my body that has been given to you. Uh, drink this. This is my life that has been poured out for you. This is how we become, as John 17, one body in him and in uh, 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 Yahuwah. This is how we become one body with the bread and the wine. Eating it and drinking it, coming into covenant with Yahushua. And returning back to Yahuwah that we may become before him boldly and with full assurance of faith, not wavering now. This is something that I believe you have to in the natural do. Just like when we made that first covenant, we in the natural had to do that. It ain't just spiritually done. Water purification, initiation into priesthood. Now let's look at that. Let's look at that real quick. All right, so were the disciples baptized before Yahushua called them, right? Now, a lot of people, you have some groups that come against baptism. They'll say that um, the disciples weren't baptized. They was with the word. The word, the baptism immersion is uh, washing of the body with the word, right? But Yahushua, he, he was immersed. And we're going to go into what his, his immersion was, but his, he was immersed. Now, let's see if... The disciples was already immersed, but they needed another cleansing that he was going to initiate them into a priesthood. Let's see. Matthew 3. It's talking about uh, Yehukanan, the immersion. Uh, Matthew 3. In those days, uh, Yehukanan, or Jonathan, or John, the immerser, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of the prophet Elijah, saying that the voice will be crying out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of Yahuwah, and make his path straight. And the same Yonathan, the Yehukana, had his raiment of camels, camel's hair and, and, and leathern girdle about his loins. And his meat was locusts, and his, with his food was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him, watch this, then went out to him, Jerusalem, and all of Judea and all of the region round about the Jordan, this everybody there was coming to him. It said, then went out to him Jerusalem, the people in Jerusalem, all of Judea and all the region round about the Jordan. Was the disciples there? Yes. And were baptized in, of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. This is saying that whole region in that area was around about that came confessing their sins. All right, let's go to the next one. Now, but they had already had that, but it was another initiation that they had to go through in order to get that priesthood back in Yahushua. All right, so now we there's a, 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 a baptism for remissions of sin that we uh, are, are you do it in Yahushua name, but then there's also an initiation into a priesthood, initiation into a priesthood. Let's look at this, John 13. I know we did this before, but we're going to break this down. John 13, now before the feast of Passover, when Yahushua knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel where he was girded. And then Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, do thou not wash my feet? And Yahushua said unto him, What I do 
now thou knowest not. But thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Yahushua said unto him. Hold on, y'all. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. But Yahushua answered and said, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part in me. So this showing you that there's an immersion, there's a washing that we have to have that has part in Yahushua. And if you go back and listen, now I want y'all to do this. Go back and listen to a message that uh, I talked called, Are We in the New Covenant Yet? Uh, in that message, you will see that we are in the betrothal process. We are not in the fullness of the New Covenant. We are in the engagement process. And when you understand the betrothal process from an a, a Eastern perspective, you will see that one thing that the bride and the groom did before they got married, they went through a purification process where the groom uh, was immersed and the bride was immersed, preparing for her husband, right? And this is why Yahushua said, I go and to prepare a place for you. This is said, I must be immersed for righteousness sake. This was him where he said he sanctified himself that we may be sanctified. So he purified himself even though he was already pure, for an example, according to John 17, for us to purify ourselves unto him. So this why I our immersion from, you know, sin and death, but our immersion to Yahushua is also important too. So this is why he began to wash the disciples' feet because he said, if I don't do this, you won't have no part in me. So if you go back and look at that lesson, you'll see in the culture, that's what they did through their betrothal process. And now we are betrothed, uh, however you say that, or engaged to Yahushua until he come and we are married to him until the fullness of the renewed covenant. But go back and look at that lesson. Again, it's called, Are We in the New Covenant Yet? And Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. All right, let's see what he said. I'm going to show you real quick something that's hid in John 13. And this is a principle of the order of priesthood. I'm going to show you that he was initiating them uh, through what he did in the beginning. But I'm going to show you this too. Well, let me see. Can I get to that real quick? Yeah. Let me show you that he was initiating them because uh, it's the same pattern that's in um, Exodus when the, when the Most High first put the priest uh, hood into their office. Exodus 29. Exodus 29 and 29. And this would be the thing that thou should do unto them and hollow them to minister unto me in the priest's office. And Aaron and his sons, thou shalt bring them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt wash them with water. Exodus 40 and 11. And thou shalt anoint the lever in his foot and sanctify it. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in a priest's office. So we see that water is a portal and an initiation to a type of priesthood. All right, now let's go back to John 13 because we know that's what Yahushua was doing. He said, what I do now thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Uh... And this is why he said, if thou, if I don't wash thy feet, thou shalt have no part with me. Because he was initiating them into a priesthood. Now let me show you the principle and the order of priesthood and sacrifice in John 13. John 13 says, he rise up from supper and laid aside his garment and took his towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured the water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. So what did he do? The same mind that we're supposed to uh, be the image. John 13, he rose up. Let this mind be with you, which also is in Yahushua HaMashiach, who being in the form of Elohim, thought it not robbery to be equal with Elohim, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So this is showing you that even from John 13, that he rose up from his heavenly throne, sitting on the right hand on the fallen. He laid aside his garment. He laid aside himself. He laid aside his likeness to become what? And like in verse five, a servant. After that, he poured out the water and began to wash his disciples' feet. It was unheard of for a master to wash the feet of his servants. 
So he had laid aside all these things in order for uh, to show us how our priesthood is supposed to operate. And those that are the leaders are to serve the body of people. Verse 8, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let's keep going. Uh, John 13. So after he had washed their feet, he took back up his garment and was set down again. And he said unto him, know you not what I have done to you. Uh, how can we call it that? After he came and was a servant to man, he humbled himself. Then he what? He died, uh, was buried and resurrected and took back up his heavenly uh, 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 his heavenly, his heavenly body and, and, and heavenly estate, and set back down at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews one and four. After when he had made purification of sin, sat down at the right hand of Majesty on the high, and had become by so much better than angels, and has inherited a more excellent name than they. Philippians two. Wherefore have God have exalted him and gave unto him a name that is above every name, and that name if Yahushua that every knee shall bow of the things of heaven and the things on earth and the on earth that every tongue shall confess that Yahushua is Hamashiach. That's another thing that we have to confess. We got to confess that he is master and that he is king. He is master and king. If any man shall confess. Yahushua uh, 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 confessed Yahushua in, in his heart and believe uh, Yahushua had died and resurrected from the grave. He shall be what? Redeemed. So these are the things going back to what we was talking about first degree. And these are the things where you look through the scripture, you find out about Yahushua. I had a slide with all that. I don't know where that went. That we have to agree with that. And this is the form of a servant mentality that we have to do just like Yahushua. That he came down in the likeness and form of a man. Uh, he took he took away his heavenly estate to come down and become a servant to serve us. And when he got done serving us and that to the ultimate form of serving, when you lay down your life for your friend, then he returned unto his glory. But he allowed who? Yahushua, Yahuwah to elevate him back unto his glory because of the sacrifice that he made. And that's how we should live for each other, become a living sacrifice, laying down our ways and burdens that we may become on the same level of those that we are trying to grow in the faith, that we're trying to mature, that we're trying to be developed and then allow Yahushua to raise us back up. Let's keep going. All right, we got to move. Or I talked about that already. I just read it. Although not mentioned in the narrative to prepare for a birthrata, it was coming for the bride and the groom to separately take a ritual immersion. The ritual immersion or the mitvah taken from the Hebrew was prior to the actual entry into the formal birthrata period and was symbolic of a spiritual cleansing. And this is where Acts 2 and 38 said, Repent and be ye baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahushua, for the forgiveness of your sins, and that you receive the gift of the, whole, the Ruach HaKadosh. All right, let's keep going. So these things gave them the ability to do what John 20 and 21 says. And I done talked about this multiple times, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. And then said Yahushua to them, peace be unto you and my father have sent me, even so I send you as the priest, as a servanthood where a priesthood. And when you have said this, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Ruach HaKadosh. He said, whoever sins that you remit, they are remitted to them. And whoever sins that you retain, they are retained unto them. So he gave them the power in this priesthood, in this servanthood through the Ruach HaKadosh to remit or uh, uh, giving peace or to retain your peace. That's why I said, if you go into a house and um, you don't, and they don't receive you, he said, take your shalom with you and dust off uh, your feet. But if they receive you, if they receive you, then leave your shalom in this place, right? So this is what that is saying, but we did teachings on that. So we're going to keep going. Another thing that you got to uh, agree with is his death, burial, and resurrection. And we're going to all scripture of the stuff that they say in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now I make known unto you, brother, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, wherein you have stand, by which ye have uh, ye also were saved or redeemed, if ye hold fast the word which I preached unto you, except ye believe in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received from uh, Yahushua Mashiach, that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
and that he was buried and that he have been raised on the third day according to the scripture. So this is what we have to confess and believe also that he was his death, his burial, and his ascension back on the right hand of the Father being our high priest that now we can boldly come before the throne of uh, grace that he has redeemed us back unto the Father. Until the death of redemption. And we, so we are seeing these things. We looked at the bread and wine. We looked at the um, robe. We looked at the things that we have to do. As in uh, returning to an oath. And uh, let's look at the seal of the covenant. Every covenant had a seal in it. This is all talking about returning the rites of passage back to the covenant. The seal of a covenant. That which binds you to the covenant of blood. Let's look at that. All right. And ancient... Ancient cultures, right? You would have a seal and every kingdom would have their stamp or their seal um, in whatever was in. Hold on, y'all. Uh, whatever, was, whatever was the content was in it, it would be sealed until it got to the receiver, right? If anybody would break that seal other than the person that it was supposed to go to, then all the rights of that would be broken and the uh, kingdom would come against you. So the seal is what binds the content within the envelope, right? It will bind it together and seals it together, not to be open until it get to the uh, designated person. You know what I'm saying? All right, let's keep going. A token or a sign is that is given to remember the covenant being made and also something to remember the promise of the terms to each each other. So a token is a sign of something they used to remember um, the covenant. Used also as a seal to bind contents inside a scroll or a letter between a person that wrote the letter and the person in which the letter is addressed. The seal binds the covenant to the promiser and the promise keeper. So the seal will bind the covenant to the promiser, the person that promised, and also the promise keeper, the person that keeping the promise. That's what a seal would do, right? Now let's keep going. The marriage covenant uh, is knowing each other binds you together, right? The oath is what makes the covenant cut, is enacts the covenant, but the sex is the seal. That's when the covenant become one and that when it binds you together where the two become one flesh then, right? It is bind together by blood, right? And this is why blood is released out of a man uh, when uh, when he's having sex. And then a woman that when you go into her, when you break the hymen, the hymen is nothing but a symbol of a covenant being broken because when you break the hymen and blood flows, that means what now y'all are one flesh and it seals y'all together. That blood binds and seals y'all and makes y'all one now. Okay? So, let's look at that with the scriptures. Uh, we already looked at John 17. This is what binds us and made us one with the Father. Hold on, y'all. All right, make us one with the Father. Let's keep going. John 16, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient that I go, for the uh, for if I don't go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of concerning sins, concerning righteousness, concerning judgment. Concerning sin, because they believe not in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. And concerning judgment, because of the prince of this world is judged. However, he, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, he shall show you things to come. He shall magnify me, for he shall receive a mind and show it unto you. All things that the Father have are mine, therefore I shall, I said that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. So the Ruach is the seal of our covenant. Each covenant has a seal. The rainbow is the seal and the sign of the Noah covenant. Abraham covenant seal and sign is circumcision that every time that a man looked down at his member, he would see the promise of the covenant, right? 
Israelite sign and seal is the Sabbath day. The Bennett sign and seal is the throne. And the renewed covenant sign and seal is the Holy Spirit. Um, and the woman, I believe, is the sign and seal of the promise of redemption from the first covenant that fell in Eden when the Most High said uh, that it is through your seed that you're going to um, brew, your seed is going to brew the head of the serpent. And it talks about that a woman would be saved through childbearing, that through her seed, her bloodline, is a promise of a restored redemption that's going to happen to the first covenant. Because each sign and seal is a promise of a redemption to come. Right? So, as we looked at, the rainbow is a sign and seal of redemption that it'll ne he'll never destroy the earth by water. The Abraham covenant is a sign and uh, seal of redemption that he's going to bring his children, that all nations will be blessed with him. He's going to bring his children back to the land. The Israelite sign and seal of the Sabbath day is that we're going to enter into our rest, be back in our land, and rule again. The Vedic uh, sign and seal is a promise that he's not going to have uh, a, a man from, uh, uh, he's going to have, you know, through his line, it's going to be a uh, man that, 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 that rules the throne. And uh, the Holy Spirit sign and seal of redemption that redeems us and seals us in this package covenant until the day of redemption, right? Let's look at that. John 15, this is my commandment that you love one another even as I have loved you. Greater love has no man that this man that has laid down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do what I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I call you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father have made known unto you. I think I made a move too fast. Well, anyway, all right. So the Ruach HaKadosh. I think I uh, might have put the wrong PowerPoint here, but it don't matter. I can I can see it from here. The Ruach HaKadosh, right? The Ruach is our sign and seal unto the day of redemption. It seals us into this promise. It seals us into this covenant, right? Until we are redeemed. Let me let me let me let me get this for you real quick. Let me get this for you. It ain't gonna take long. Let me get this for you. So I wanna I wanna prove that uh, so I can make sure you have that. Let's look at Ephesians 1 and 13. Again, the Ruach HaKadosh is important to have the Ruach because he seals the content. He seals the content of the covenant. All right, let's go back. He seals the content of the covenant. It says, use also as a seal to bind the contents in a side of a scroll, the letter between the person that wrote the letter and the person that the letter is addressed. The seal binds the covenant to the promiser and the promise keeper. So now the seal, the ruach, is the thing that binds us to the covenant of what Yahuwah spoke about us and the promise keepers. So he is what, what establishes us when we come into Yahushua. Now we are sealed through him that the contents of the covenant be within us between the promiser and the promise keeper. Now we are sealed. The contents of this covenant is sealed through the Ruach HaKadosh, right? Let's look at Ephesians 1 and 13. It says, let's get it. In whom you have trusted after you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your redemption, and in whom after you also believe you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Letting us know that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So this is why it's important for us to understand these things and be able to walk in these things because we've been sealed through Yahushua. We've been sealed through the Ruach HaKadosh to be able to operate and walk in the contents of the covenant. This is why it's so important to have the Ruach HaKadosh, to walk in him, to walk, uh, uh, allow him 
to what it says that Ruach was going to do. What did it say Ruach going to do in us? Let's look at that again. Verse 8, John 16, starting at verse 8. Let's see what it says. And it reads, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and concerning righteousness and judgment. So he's going to begin to reprove your sin so you can keep your seal sealed. He's going to concern in righteousness. Because he's going to go to the Father, and you shall see him no more, and concerning judgment. So the Ruach HaKadosh is going to seal all these things, right? Because you don't want to break the seal <laughs> of the Ruach through your acting crazy. He don't want that to do that when you break the seal. When you get to acting up and, and, and you ain't sealed no more, all right? So we look at Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, it says, In him... You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, have also believed and you were sealed in him with your promise who has given you a pledge of our inheritance. I have to find this. Has given you a pledge of our inheritance with view of redemption of God's own possession in praise of his glory. Right? Second Corinthians 5 and 5. Now he hath prepared for us the very purpose of God who has gave us this pledge, who have gave us the spirit as a pledge. Again, 2 Corinthians 5 5. Now, he who prepared us for this promise is God, who have gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Now, I'm giving you the Spirit as a pledge to my promises that I've spoken that's going to be yours, right? Ephesians 4 and 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of, of Elohim, by in whom ye were sealed until the day of redemption. We are sealed into the day of redemption. This is what the Most High have done for us. This is what we are walking into, family. This is what the, the fullness of what we are walking into and the fullness of what he set out for us. Right? Let's look at that. Now, y'all going to have to follow me because uh, I evidently put the wrong... Uh, PowerPoint in here, right? I have made some changes to it. So uh, I want to go back real quick to John 13 because I got to show you something. I don't want to leave you and don't show you this. John 13, all right? And I apologize for that. I thought I had the right one. But y'all y'all got your scriptures. Just follow along with me. John 13 and verse 10. John 13 and verse 10. And Yahushua said unto them, He that is washed needeth not but to wash his feet, but is clean ever with. And ye are clean, but not all. The man who has been bathed is clean, but his feet come in contact with dust. With the dust. If then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, you also are to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do this at uh you that you should do what I have done to you. Now why would he say, let's look at verse, uh, John 13 and 10, look at verse, uh, I think it's verse 11. And it says, John 13 and 10, it says, He that is washed needeth not but to be washed his feet, but he is clean ever with. And ye are clean. Now, him saying that is a Hebrew idiom, right? And you have, well, it's not a Hebrew idiom, but it's something that they would have understood. What he's saying, that he that has been washed needeth not but to wash his feet. The man who hath been bathed is clean, but his feet come in contact with the dust of the ground. So what is he saying? He's saying, like during those times, there was a lot of dirt and sand everywhere. So when they were washed, he was saying that a man would wa that would be washed, all he would need to do is his feet be washed. That when he had bathed, that when he would travel to go to another man's house, what would happen that the servants, because uh, people had servants back then, where the servants would come out and wash the feet of the people that just traveled to the next house. So he was saying that he that hath been washed hath been washed already, but his feet. 
What is he trying to show you? He said, I have cleansed you, going back to John 13, when he began to wash them. He said, I have spiritually and morally cleansed you and made you new. But just like in the natural, when you are walking, that's why I said beautiful are the feet of those that carry the gospel. When you're walking, your feet going to get in contact with the dirt and get dirty. What is he showing you? He said, in this walk, even though you've been declared righteous, you've been declared sanctified, you've been perfected, you have been washed, you have been clean. But as you walk, the uh, uh, wickedness of this world, the trials and tribulations are going to come to try to make your clean walk unclean. You're going to come into contact with some dirty thing. And it might be some times where your feet need washing. It might be some times where you fail. It might be some times where you make mistakes. It might be some times where you fall short. Then he said, as I have washed your feet, you wash each other's feet. Because carrying this gospel and being in contact with this evil and wicked world, with these wicked things around us, that our feet was going to get dirty through the cares of this life, through all these things that happened, right? And he said, now, now, if I have washed your feet, now you wash each other. That's verse 14. If then your Lord and master have washed your feet, you also have to wash each other's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do what I have done. So what in is, what is an example of washing each other's feet? James 1. James 1 and 13. Follow along with what I'm saying. This was in the slide, but I got to roll. James 1 and 13. This is what it means. We put too much emphasis on actually washing people's feet. I mean, that's fine. But when you go back, that's why I say get your ancient mind back because when you go back into history, you know when they took a bath, they was clean. But if they took a bath and had to go to somebody else's house with sandals, they had to do what? Their feet would get dusty and dirty and the servants that was in the house that would be waiting to own, um, the people to get there, they would wash the master's feet or whoever was there. And so it was a, a straight contradiction for the owner of the home to be washing the feet as a servant. So this is why he still still he stooped down and washed their feet as a servant. And while Peter was saying, Master, you shall never wash my feet. I shall wash yours. And he said, you don't know what I'm doing unto you. You don't know why I'm washing y'all. But this is why Peter was saying, I am the servant. You're not the servant. But Yahushua was saying, this is the mentality you got to have. You have to come to the body as a servant. And take a lowly form and wash your brother's feet. Right? But he was also saying, now I have made you, declared you righteous. You got the revelation of who I am, so you are clean. You are perfected. You are sanctified. I sanctified myself, so you may be sanctified. But he said, in this walk, beautiful though the feet of those that carry the gospel, in this walk, your feet are going to get dirty sometimes. You're going to go through some things that might hurt you. You're going to go through some things that might make you, uh, 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 how you feeling, sir, uh, 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 make you down or uh, uh, people betray you and people walk out on you and people talk about you. All these type of things that might affect you in a certain way and it gets you in a certain way that your feet might become dirty. But you have another brother that might see that your feet are dirty. Now I'm going to wash your feet. Now let's look at what washing your feet is. James 1 and 13. Is there any among you that afflict? Let him pray. And is, is there any merit? Let him sing songs. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him and anoint him with awe in the name of Yahushua. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he had committed any sins, they shall be forgiven. How do we wash each other's feet? Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed, that the effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You wash each other's feet by praying for each other, by looking at some areas in our life that may be stagnated, that we might have dropped the ball, that somebody happened, and then we begin to confess our fault. Confessing your faults one to another is Hebraically washing each other's feet. The same thing, let's go to... Um, Galatians 6, Galatians 6, verse 1. Galatians 6 and verse 1. Brethren if, 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 brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye that which are spiritual, 
Restore such a one with the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be tempted. Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Hamashiach. What's the law? Fulfill the law of Hamashiach. What? Being a servant for each other and doing what? Bearing each other burdens, what? Washing each other's feet because we've been declared righteous, we've been sanctified, but our feet get dirty in this walk, in this path. So we are the ye that are spiritual. Do what? Restore such a one. Wash his feet that his feet may be clean again, that he may continuously carry on the gospel. Hebrews 10. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful to him that is promised. And let us consider one another to provoke one another to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves coming together. Because when we assemble ourselves together, we're washing each other's feet. When you come to these events that we do, these feast days, and we begin to prophesy to you, we begin to lay hands on you, you begin to lay your burdens at the altar. What is that called? That called washing each other's feet, getting each other clean for the most high. This is what this is about. This is what it means to serve each other, uh, uh, to love each other, to wash each other's feet. All right, let's keep going. Now, I'm going to talk about it real quick because we talked about we talked about the robe initially and the other uh, ones and you know and, and the name and, and and this one we talked about uh, returning of the oath the uh, you're confessing who you who she is we talked about um, the bread and the wine uh, we talked about the water and we talked about the washing of each other's feet and now we're going to talk about what it means to be a covenant friend because you weren't just a friend. <laughs> Well, we sang that song, I am a friend of God, I'm a friend of God, I'm a friend you come. Mm -mm. Everybody ain't a friend. That is a certain Hebrew terminology that they understood in their culture, what a friend of the groom meant and what it means to be a friend of Elohim. So let's see if, make sure I got this in the presentation. And we talked about the seal. All right. John 15, you know, we talk about the seal, the seal being the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit seals us into the day of redemption, how it keeps the content of the promiser and the promise keeper that we're supposed to keep the promise together. We are the pledge. It pledges us to the most high until the day of redemption. Just like the man, the man is the foundation of the family, but the woman binds the family together. All right, so let's keep going. John 15, let's talk about this friend real quick. This is my commandment that ye love one another, that I love you. Greater love is no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do what? Whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for a servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I call you friends for all things that I have heard and my Father have made them known unto you. So when you come into covenant with a person, then that takes you from a servant, from servanthood to friendship. Now I can make known to you the mysteries of the kingdom, right? Because you done came into covenant with me. Now let's keep going with that. John 3, ye yourselves bear witness of me that I said I am not the Christ, but I, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom withstandeth and heareth him, Rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So in ancient times, the friend of the bridegroom is basically the um, the best man. All right, the, the best man would be the friend of the bride. All right, so what did the best man do? All right, let's look at this. I don't have it there because, uh, like I said, I put up the wrong one, but that's all right. We're going we're gonna to tell you. What the friend of the bride did. Alright, so the friend of the bride in Yehusha's day, the supporting role is in a wedding was the place of honor and respect. It was called a person of great stature and responsibility. And that time the friend of the bridegroom was in charge of the entire marriage event. He invited the guests and planned to organize the wedding ceremony and hosted oversaw the reception. He even arranged the honeymoon. And going ahead of the couple to make sure everything was in place for his friend. 
and the bride. He was also secured in that new home, preparing it for the couple to live in. In the short, the friend of the bridegroom was responsible for it all. His role was the rigorous work of love and grace and from the beginning to the end. So to be called a friend, right? The friend of the bridegroom, which is we supposed to be the bride and also a covenant partner as a friend. That's why he said, now you are my friends if you do what I say, because now you are in covenant with me. Now I'm going to put, I'm going to go away and I'm going to put you in charge of preparing this wedding. So you got to make a people ready for my return. You got to prepare the way for my return. You got to get a people to have them understand what my return means, understand what the revelation of who I am means. Having a bride ready and set up for my return, my return. This is what it means to be a friend of the bridegroom, right? Almost the best man. The work that we're supposed to do and that we're supposed to be carrying out is the work of a friend of the bridegroom. Preparing the way, just as uh, Yehukanan said in the scripture, preparing the way for the groom and the bride. All right, being that mediator, being that priest that prepares the way and make a uh, 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 the bride ready and prepared for the wedding day and for that great day of his return. All of us move from position of just bride to bride to the bridegroom's friend where we prepare and organize and get in preparation the wedding of your And all you have to do is look up friend of the bride in the scripture or in the culture and you'll understand it to give you that what that means, right? And let me show you this also in the old books of the Bible, Genesis 24. For Isaac and Rebecca, let me show you a friend of the bride or the father. Genesis 24, verse 1. Abraham was now very old, and Yahuwah would have blessed him in every way. He said unto the senior servant in the household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, and I want you to swear by Yahuwah and the Elohim of heaven and the Elohim of earth that you would not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, but among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son. So the servant, I think it was Eleazar, he was the bride or the father of the bride or the bridegroom friend where he went out and orchestrated this thing and got this thing. He swear by the oath, he reached under his thigh. The reason he did that in, in ancient times, that was the form of the covenant was with circumcision. So what they would do, they would grab uh, under his thigh, the member of the man, and swear on that oath, swear on that covenant that they would go and do what was said, um, and that was spoken. And he was in the form of a friend of the bridegroom and the father, where he prepared the way for the bride to come and prepared a place for them to stay. So this is what that means. Now, let me go to the scriptures that talks about the, the tragedy of the spies and these covenant rights, right? So now we understand how do we return, right? It ain't just a sinner's prayer. It's different things that you have to understand, right? What we just talked about. We talked about the robe early. We talked about um, uh, perfection, sanctification. We talked about um, the oath and returning to that oath um, through agreeing to the revelation of who Yahushua you, you, is and declaring that pro Professing that, not just saying it in your heart, but professing it and living it out. We have to profess in agreement with this thing to return to that. We talked about uh, the bread and the wine, uh, uh, being part, making ourselves a part of his body and part of his life, according to John 17, becoming one with him. Uh, we talked about um, the immersion process, first getting remission for our sins, but then being immersed to, to Mashiach and to his return. Um, and then we talked about the Holy Spirit, the the, 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 the the importance of receiving the Ruach HaKadosh. He is the seal of that promise that we're going to need and the power to be able to walk in those promises and walk as an oracle. He makes you an oracle of the Most High and begin to do the work of priesthood where we are washing each other's feet um, through caring for each other, confessing our faults to one another. Uh, 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 praying for each other. You that is spiritual when you say a brother uh, has fallen and restored him back unto you. 
All these things is part of the walk and being a friend of the bridegroom where you're orchestrating and part of the ministry of reconciliation that you're returning and getting a people prepared for uh, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, getting the people ready, uh, orchestrating this thing. All right? But what happens if you reject all this? Hebrews 10 and 20 says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, after you came into this awakening and came into who the Mosai is and, and, and came into understanding this covenant, if you deliberately keep on sinning after that, you receive the knowledge of truth, there is no more sacrifice for your sins left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of Yahoo. So you'll be consumed with his enemy and be declared as an enemy to be able to walk into this truth, do the rites of passage and still fall away and continues to sin and count the, the sacrifice as nothing. He said, you will be consumed as a judgment that's going to, you're going to, you're looking forward to a judgment on this, on the most high enemies and praying against the most high enemies. But if you continue in this, you going to get the same fearful look of being destroyed as the enemies are being destroyed. A judgment and raging fire that will consume the enemies. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two and three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone that deserves to be punished, that trample on the son of Elohim underfoot, who has been treated as an unholy thing of the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, or who was who has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay and again, and Yahuwah will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to foul in the hands of a living Elohim. So if you come into this knowledge and this understanding, you go through these rites of passage, you do all these things, and you end up turning your back and reject it, it'll be no, you can't, re, it's no way of return. You can't return. You didn't count it the sacrifice unworthy. You didn't count the sacrifice unworthy. It's no return from you breaking and then breaking that. And then, you know, while it's better for you to do it in ignorance. A lot of stuff we got away with when we was in Christianity because we was doing it in ignorance. But when you come over here and understand the fullness of this and then still decide to walk away, it ain't no but judgment waiting on you. That's why you can't be playing with this thing. This ain't nothing to play with. This ain't Christianity. You can't be in this thing and think you can play around and think that the Most High won't judge your behind and consume your behind. First, destroy and consume your life. It consume your, your aspirations, the thing that you're trying to get accomplished, all your goals that then consume you. We can't play with this thing. This thing is too serious. But sometimes he might not just judge you, but he'll judge your lineage. He'll judge your children. He said that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they not only reject me, but they reject my laws. Therefore, I will what? Reject and forget their what? Children. Unless their children awaken and walk in my path. So this why it's so important that you can't play with this thing. You can't be half in this thing and half not in this thing. You can't be somewhat in and somewhat out. You can't make a, a rite of passage to return into the Most High and still want to do your thing. The Most High will destroy you. And everything that you put your life and your heart on. But you'll see it dissolve before your eyes. So family, I wanted to give you all this. Hope this was able to minister to you. Hope this helped you out. Uh, go look at both uh, videos uh, because it's uh, very important. I believe once we get this and walk in this, I believe those mantles is just going to drop on us. If they haven't already been dropping on you. Uh, going to drop on us and then we'll become ministers of his judgment to be able to walk in full functionality of the covenant with him on our side because the persecution is ramping up getting us ready to go through a shaking to then become become a what a army bone to his bone that cannot be defeated because he will identify who his people is through demonstration of power that's going to happen. It ain't going to be just through no books. It ain't just going to be through uh, no research, but it's going to be through demonstration of power of a people that have returned back unto him the right way that the mantles of uh, our ancestors then fall upon us and then we became ministers of his judgment, man. We became the Tedis nation, 
this thing upside down in the Ruach and in covenant. So we love you and we bid you shalom. Return back unto the covenant the right way. Go back to the ancient paths. Return unto him. Go through these things. You, the, the, the Ruach been dealing with me that I'm going to collectively with my body of tribe in Augusta. We're going to go through every last one of these things to return back rightfully unto him and be able to walk in the fullness of assurance of who we are in our Elohim. So I say shalom to you and y'all bless.